Good afternoon and welcome to the launch of the City UK's Total Tax Contribution Report. My name is Emma Reynolds. I'm the Managing Director of Public Affairs Policy and Research at the City UK. And before we consider the subject of the report we're launching this afternoon, I wanted to take a couple of moments uh, to reflect on the tragedy uh, of Sir David Amos's killing on Friday. He was an MP who dedicated his life to serving his constituents and the public, hugely popular in his constituency and indeed on all sides of the House of Commons. I have some very fond memories when I was a serving MP of David's uh, kindness, his uh, generosity, and indeed when I lost my seat in December 2019, he wrote me an incredibly warm and kind letter. Uh, and um, I will be handing over to Ian Lidore Granger in just a moment or two, but I think um, it is fitting to, on behalf of the City UK and our members, to send our deepest sympathy to David's family and colleagues. And it's absolutely essential that the government and the police now bolster the security of our elected representatives. On to the City UK's total tax contribution report. This is the third report we've published with the help of research from PwC, so big thank you to PwC, on the tax contribution um, of accounting and legal services in the UK, following on from research we published in 2017 and 2019. Uh, and like our previous research, this report estimates the contribution made in taxes borne and collected by legal and accounting firms to the UK public finances. Uh, legal and accounting activities are a key part of the UK's world leading financial and related professional services ecosystem and a source of high value jobs. And I think what this report also does is highlights the contribution of this invaluable sector to the wider economy. This report complements other research undertaken by our colleagues at the City of London Corporation and UK Finance, who respectively uh, have launched recent reports on the contribution of financial services and the banking sectors. When these pieces of work are combined, we find that financial services, legal and accounting activities uh, combined, contribute an, ex ex an estimated 96.1 billion in taxes born and collected in 2020, representing 13% of total tax uh, receipts and UK receipts, despite making up 10% of GDP and 2.3% of the country's workforce, indicating high value jobs and high pro productivity of our industry. I will soon be over handing over to Ian Little Granger, MP, who we're very we're delighted could join us this afternoon, um, before handing over to our chief economist to set out the broad parameters of the report. And then we have a fantastic distinguished panel uh, to see us through a discussion of its findings. So um, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce Ian Little Granger, MP, who has represented the constituency of Bridgewater and West Somerset uh, since June 2001. So has had a long and distinguished career in Parliament prior to um, being elected, a background in the Territorial Army and also as Managing Director of a Property Management and Development Company. Um, Ian is a very active parliamentarian, a member of the International Development Select Committee, uh, very, very actively involved at the Council of Europe. And uh, to our intents and purposes, Ian is incredibly important because he chairs the APPG, the All Party Parliamentary Group, group in Parliament on Taxation. So we're delighted uh, that you could join us, Ian. Uh, and maybe if you could turn your camera on, we could see you. That would be even, uh, even better. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to you um, for some remarks. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, Emma, thank you so much. We do miss you in Parliament, as you know, and I'm looking forward to seeing you very soon. And thank you, um, thank you so much for the invitation. First, can I thank PwC for doing this report? Because I think it is an excellent report. And it's the third in the, in the line of reports, but it is crucially important. And also, Angelica, who is put this together as Chief Economist for the City UK. But I think the most important about this is the contribution that um, the legal and financial services give to this country. And I mean, I think it's quite remarkable, 20.5 billion um, made up of 8.4 billion and 12 billion in taxes collected, 2.8% of total government receipts in, in um, 2020. It's a remarkable figure from a remarkable, um, dare I say, industry. And I think this is what is so important that we keep government aware of the service industries in the United Kingdom that are crucial 
to everything we do. And th these three reports over the, the, the consecutive years they've been written show just what an important part that we play. But also the COVID-19 situation for the last, we'll say two years, has actually shown we must work in a different way as well. That the government needs to be more, dare I say, uh, there are on tax and the way it operates and gets tax and watches the tax take, but also make sure that the companies and the organisations that create that, be they the city, be the, um, uh, the um, uh, finance and whatever, is actually celebrated and is pushed forward. And I think it's absolutely vital that we as parliamentarians continue to make sure the government understands this. Sonia Rashak is at the moment looking at the tax take in a very, dare I say, a fairly narrow way. And that comes down to politics. But what it forgets is actually there's an entire raft of people who are doing a huge amount, which we need to keep doing what they're doing. I would loathe it to see everybody then be camped to Paris or Frankfurt, as the great saying goes. And I don't think that'll happen, but it is, it is worth remembering that. And I think the other point about this is that it's incredible how much investment has been put in considering we've been through the most frightful pandemic. I mean, the figures are absolutely amazing as to what people have been doing and continuing to invest, to continuing to take on recruitment in continuing to make sure that all the systems work, even though most people have been working from home, which I think is a remarkable achievement. It's very hard to train people when they're in their attic. And therefore, I think it has been most important to make sure that this report is circulated as much as possible. But I do want to just say a few words, if I may, about the old parliamentary group, because I think a lot of people probably are wondering what on earth it is. In the House of Commons, we have something I think is almost unique in the world, where any sector or part of the sector can be, become an old parliamentary group. And I happen to head the taxation group with colleagues from both the House of Commons and both the Lords. So therefore, we are cross-party, we're non-political, we have um, a secretariat, which looks after us extremely well under um, Murray Stewart, and we make sure that we influence government. So therefore, we are very lucky that we have both government and opposition um, shadow treasury officials and uh, uh, chancellors to come and talk to us about what is important to them and why it is important to them. But it much more so that we can also then place questions. We can then actually ask to see ministers. And there are times that we have been approached by colleagues from the sector to say, could we influence whatever it may be? Sometimes it's the budget, but much more often it's about fairly small parts of legislation or stuff that can be de dealt with through statutory instruments, in other words, delegated responsibility. And that's what the old parliamentary group is about. And I would ask anybody who wishes to come along or is interested in this, please get in touch. You can um, type in APPG taxation, House of Commons, and I, we will come up. And we welcome members and colleagues to come along and listen to what we do, why we do it and how we do it. And I think this is why this report is so important. And I will be sending this up to the Financial Secretary of the Treasury so that they can understand really what people like, um, uh, well, right across the sector, are doing to, to help UK PLC. And I think this is all part of what government is about. And as Emma remembers from her days, that it was crucial to be able to influence me, um, uh, ministers and shadow ministers as to what people are thinking and what the future holds. So therefore, I think this report is crucially important. The timing is perfect. We've got a lot of financial decisions coming up, at least for budgets, etc. There is going to be, I think, changes in the tax take. I think there'll be changes in the way that we operate within the House. In other words, looking at business, looking at the way business operates. You can start to see it under uh, Quasi and others. And that we have to be able to move much more quickly in, in achieving what we want. And reports like this just show how important certain sectors are. So I'm very grateful indeed. And with that, can I please hand back now to Emma and um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Ian, thank you so much for being uh, with us. And thank you for what you've said about uh, the industries that... Um, uh, pay those taxes being celebrated and also for the open and collaborative way in which you chair the all party group. Um, a member of my public affairs team attended uh, a meeting that you held um, just before the summer uh, and it's, it's really wonderful to see that open approach because I know not all APPGs uh, welcome um, external people. So thank you so much for being with us and thank you for 
what you've said and we look forward to keeping in touch so that we can bang the drum of having successful industries uh, like ours that, that contribute so much in taxation. Thanks again. And really sorry that you can't join the panel, which was uh, what we intended, but obviously given that you would um, are going to be there for Sir David Amos's uh, memorial service uh, in the house, um, we wish you uh, a good journey uh, uh, into Westminster. Thanks again, Ian, and look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, Thanks so much. <laughs> Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Angelica Bardalai, our Chief Economist, who has overseen the research for this report and will now present um, the uh, contour, should we say, the framework of the report. Over to you, Angelica. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much, Emma, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am really pleased to be able to take you through the highlights of what might be one of our slightly less well-known pieces of economic research. Um, so I'll just start by giving you a little bit of context, if we could please move to the next slide. Um, maybe if it is the case that um, this report is a bit less well-known than some of our other economic research reports is because um, this is indeed one that we publish every alternate year working with PwC. Um, huge thanks to PwC for the terrific work that's, um, that's gone into this. And this, as you've heard, is indeed the third iteration of this particular research. And it is the sort of professional services counterpart to the work that the City of London Corporation publish every year examining the total tax contribution of the financial services industry. And so the idea is that together our research does allow us to start to paint a picture of the contribution of the whole financial and related professional services industry um, and the contribution that it makes in particular to the UK public finances. And as you've heard, that contribution is significant. Um, financial services plus legal and accounting services contributed um, just under £100 billion uh, in taxes born and collected in, in 2020, and that accounts for um, more than a tenth of total UK tax revenue. So if we go to the next slide now, please, um, we can take a look at the main findings of our new research, which focuses on the legal and accounting subsector. Um, you heard me mention taxes born and collected a moment ago. So now, very, very briefly, this is the only kind of semi-technical part of, um, of my remarks. So the analysis is based on um, taxes, levied, taxes levied on a firm, which are the taxes born, um, and then taxes collected by a firm for its employees and, and customers. Um, that's obviously the taxes collected. And you can see the main findings of the research here. Uh, the total tax contribution of UK legal and accounting firms was just over 20 billion pounds in the tax year ending 2020. Um, and compared to the research that was undertaken uh, two years ago, um, that £20.5 billion figure does represent an increase of around 5.5%. Now, the other thing that you see here on this slide is the distribution of value. <clears throat> so that's the pie chart on the, on the right. Um, the value of legal and accounting activities goes, obviously, to the government in the form of taxes. It also goes to employees as wages and to partners as profits. And what you see here from this pie chart is that the total tax contribution paid to government was about half of the total value distributed. Now, although this research is focused on the tax contribution, um, we did also want to provide some wider context in the report. And so the research also includes other indicators of the sector's economic contribution. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Here, what you see is um, on the left, uh, you know, we put GVA, so essentially economic output. And you see that legal and accounting GVA has grown much faster over the past decade than overall UK GVA. And indeed, it grew faster than uh, GVA of the financial services sector as well. Um, so just to put a couple of numbers on that, uh, the average annual growth rate for legal and accounting GVA was 3.1% over the last decade, 2011 through 2020. Um, and that's in contrast to UK GVA overall, which rose by an annual average of just 0.6% during that period. And then on the right-hand chart, um, you see that uh, the legal and accounting subsector has outperformed the UK economy as a whole in terms of productivity, um, just with that one exception of the, of the third quarter of 
2020. Then the sector also makes a very important contribution to employment. So if we could move to the next slide. Here you see um, on the first pie chart on the left, what you see is UK employment by sector. So professional, scientific and technical activities, which is the category that the Office for National Statistics uses, um, of which legal and accounting services is then a subsector. So that wider category represents almost 10% of total UK employment. And then what you see from the other chart on the right is you see the professional scientific and technical services sector broken down. And there you see that legal services and also the wider subsector that includes the accounting services, um, those are both very significant contributors to professional services employment overall. So in total, uh, legal and accounting services as a subsector is made up of 77,000 firms employing a total of around three quarters of a million people. And then finally, on my last slide, please, um, you can see some of the impact that this employment has had during the pandemic. So this year, um, for, for this year's research, um, PwC undertook a special survey of participants in the total tax contribution uh, work and asked them about how they addressed the challenges of COVID-19 in the, in the full calendar year 2020. And this slide shows you a summary of the survey results. And you can see, for example, that there was really minimal use of the furlough scheme or there was, you know, really minimal um, kind of instances of firms resorting to redundancies. There was also a really minimal impact on graduate recruitment. And that is a point that I actually think is particularly important because overall, on average, the negative economic effects of the pandemic have tended to fall uh, more heavily on, on young people and young workers than on, on older workers. And I think that this reinforces some of the earlier points about the importance of the subsector to uh, employment, but it also highlights in particular the resilience of the subsector. And that is actually another point that I think is, is really particularly worth emphasizing and, and drawing out, given that, you know, you know happily, um, all things, although things are nowhere near as, as gloomy in terms of the public health situation as they were this time last year, um, you know, I think we can see from, from the current data that uh, this pandemic is, is far from over, right? So, you know, the, the data we have today, it's at the set sort of seven day average of COVID cases is well over 40,000 and, you know, it's rising steadily. And so what I think that means is that sectors like legal and accounting, which are resilient and which have made an important contribution to the economy and in particular to employment, um, those attributes and that resilience, which has been so important in, in the past 18 months, will continue to be, will be equally important um, in the 18 months and indeed uh, the months beyond going forward. So I hope that's given you an overview of the research, but of course I'd encourage you to download the report and to go through everything in more detail. But um, for now I'll end there and uh, let me hand back to Emma. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica, for giving us that overview. And thank you to you and Ian Little Granger for um, making those initial presentations. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel, minus Ian, unfortunately, um, uh, this afternoon. Um, so a, a big thank you and a welcome to uh, Janet Kerr, um, who leads uh, PwC's tax transparency and total tax contribution work. Uh, thank you for your work on this report, um, Janet, and I'm just going to ask you a, a couple of detailed questions about the report in just a, a moment. But before I do so, I wanted to also welcome Sandy Bogle, um, uh, and lovely to see you, Sandy. Uh, Sandy, uh, like Janet, is a great expert in all things tax and a very important person uh, to the City UK because Sandy uh, chairs the City UK's tax group, a highly influential group in our organisation and one that um, it, whose mission it is to create the best possible uh, taxation system for our members and also a partner at Gibson Dunn. Thank you, Sandy, for, for being uh, with us. Um, so, Janet, firstly to you, um, just really interested in, in your thoughts about what the um, implications of the sort of 
you know, the big tax numbers, what do they actually mean in terms of the contribution of this sector to the wider UK economy? We saw some uh, findings there that Angelica presented about employment. We're really interested in your view of the wider contribution of legal and accounting sector, sector to, the, to the, the bigger picture. Over to you. Thanks, Emma. Um, good afternoon. Um, so, yes, um, to take your question, the contribution from this legal and accounting sector is significant, 20.5 billion, 2.8% of government receipts. But it, it is, I think that wider picture is really important. Um, you know, the UK has got a, a world leading financial services sector, and that too makes a significant contribution. And it's that broader financial ecosystem that's really important to kind of bring into the mix here. And um, as uh, Angelica was mentioning, we do have some data to provide that broader context. So together with the City of London Corporation, we carry out a, a total tax contribution study for the UK financial services sector. So in the same way that we surveyed legal and accounting firms, um, for that survey, uh, we survey banks, insurance companies, and others. And taking them together, we estimate the contribution from the UK financial services sector to be around 75 billion, so 10% of government receipts. But, but obviously that sector needs the, the broader financial ecosystem and uh, the legal and accounting sector as part of that. And I think um, it was Angelica that said, and I've and it's the press picked this up as well this morning, that if you take the 75 billion uh, from the financial services and the 20 billion from the legal and accounting sector, you end up with 95 billion. That's 13% uh, of, of government receipts. So it's that broader picture um, that's really important to consider um, when looking at these, these survey results. Thank you so much. And maybe uh, just a definitional question. Um, why do you include taxes collected in the total? And are they actually the firm's taxes? How, how do you, how, how, what are your definitions in the report? Yeah, no, so that's a question that we quite often get asked. Um, so we do, we, we include um, taxes born, that was 8.4 billion in the, um, in the survey, and taxes collected, that was 12.1 billion. And that covers the range of taxes, so corporation tax, employment taxes, income tax paid by partners, VAT and other taxes. Um, and actually, I'm just let me, let me drop in there, having mentioned that range of taxes, just a real thanks to your members for supporting the survey. So actually collecting all those taxes from around the business it, like it's not an insubstantial task so so a real thanks to your members for for uh pulling those numbers together and supporting the survey we couldn't do the research without it the reason for including then um the taxes collected so collected from um employees and customers on behalf of the government so things like net VAT, employee national insurance, um, is because while they're not a cost to the firm, they're generated by the firm's business activity. So they're part of that indirect contribution to tax revenues. Taxes born and taxes collected are clearly different beasts. One is a cost, the other is, is the uh, kind of indirect contribution. And we, we do make a clear distinction between the two. Uh, and if you if you look at employment, for example, the research showed, uh, and Angelique was saying, you know, this is a, um, a, a skilled sector, but every, for every employee in the survey, on average, um, an amount of £30,000 was paid in employment taxes. So that's both taxes born and taxes collected. So it's a measure of the contribution to the public finances for every job created by these firms. So to answer the question, we include both a tax born and a tax collected, but make a clear distinction uh, between the two. Thanks, Janet, that's, that's really clear. Um, before I hand over to Sandy, I just wondered, you haven't embarked on this research yet, but one of the things that came out in the report was 
um, you know, the, the what you've collected is comes into 2020, but only just the start of the pandemic. Have you got any predictions about what the um, COVID-19 pandemic might have um, might might result in in terms of the, the next edition of this report? No, as you say, so uh, the data that we collected was uh, for accounting periods up to June 2020. So um, a number of firms had year ends in December and April. So we, we got only the, the kind of a very small amount of uh, COVID data. But, but really, we saw um, from the questions that we asked around COVID, we saw a, a real resilience from the sector. So uh, the, in terms of graduate recruitment, um, that was almost maintained at pre-pandemic levels little use of um, the furlough scheme and so my prediction would be clearly it's it's been a tough time and we expect to see some volatility um, but I would expect uh, overall to see that the sector had been resilient through COVID. That's really positive and, and um, Sandy um, I'd be interested in your view of the resilience of the sector. That's one of its strengths, but it has many other strengths. Um, what do you think this report tells us about that wider uh, contribution and how do you think we can leverage it with policymakers? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, uh, thanks for having me and uh, apologies for smiling earlier. When, any, when anyone uses the word important and bogle in the same sentence, I always laugh because I assume they're talking about my father. Um, I think that... I don't think there's any doubt really about the wider contribution that the financial services sector makes to the UK economy. Uh, I mean, I think even the most sort of cynical politicians accept that. Um, I think that the fact that it continues to thrive um, in economically challenging times hopefully means that, you know, people recognise that it is an industry that it's important to preserve because, you know, it can sort of, you know, be um, a force for good um, in, in, in different circumstances and, and, and when dealing with, with, with different challenging situations. I also think that um, it sort of brings together so many kind of historically different parts of the UK economy, but in a way now that is kind of very much at the heart of what we do. I mean, this might not, you know, sit well with with a lot of people but you know the uk is fundamentally a services economy now you know we do make things but not maybe in the way that we had historically and the balance of the economy has moved in such a way that the importance of capital and the importance of our ability to you know leverage what the uk is really good at you know the financial services industry is you know a, a sort of a huge beacon for that and so I would hope that sort of information like this and reports like this, and, and you know, I agree hats off to PwC. I think it's an outstanding piece of work. You know, they're, they're very, very important, you know, to enable, you know, people to see sort of, you know, um, well-researched evidence of the contribution that the sector makes and therefore why, you know, when people talk about um, it being something that should be protected, um, you know, whether we're talking about, international negotiations, you know, whether we're talking about encouraging investment into the UK, whether we're talking about, you know, improving skills and, um, you know, innovation in the economy, you know, financial services has a huge role to play in all of that. And, you know, hopefully this kind of report just provides another sort of block of evidence for that. Thanks. And, and maybe you could say a little bit more about, you know, the tax group that you chair, um, which is, you um, uh, taken, drawn from a, a number of our very senior members from a, across financial related professional services. What are your key asks uh, of government? And do you think government and parliamentarians indeed are, are, are listening to those asks? That's, that's a very good question. Um, I'll start with the easier part of it first. Uh, as you say, um, the City UK has probably one of the broadest memberships of uh, organizations that are in you know, a part of the wider financial services sector um, and the tax committee reflects that so we have managed uh, we have members rather I should say from banks insurance companies asset managers law firms accounting firms uh, a number of other related bodies um, other trade bodies who sort of fall within the city UK umbrella in terms of having sort of linked needs um, that you know that 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 sort of the, the broad makeup of the membership. The way that the committee has positioned itself in the past is that because of the sort of breadth of membership and therefore the fact that we don't necessarily have a particular focus on one sector or one 
um, sub aspect of the financial services world, we sort of tend to focus on kind of key macro issues that you know we feel will be a benefit to all members. They're not a huge number of those from a tax perspective, but obviously when they do come up, they tend to be in relation to you know you know big issues and material amounts. So over the years, you know, we have been sort of communicating with stakeholders about, you know, things like sort of Brexit, you know, changes to fund policy, um, you know, the bank surcharge, um, you know, changes to, um, you know, regulation that will impact all of those industries, you know, uh, sort of capital rule changes that have impacted people like the insurance industry. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a range of things that, you know, may, 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 may come in front of us. And, you know, given the sort of, you know, the time factor, obviously the committee has to sort of triage what it can, can and, and can't and can't do. Um, we also try and maintain dialogue with, you know, interested parties. So we regularly talk to Treasury and Revenue. Uh, we talk to the OECD where we can uh, about issues that are impacting both the UK and um, City UK members internationally. Um, and where appropriate, we may communicate with other supranational bodies like the EU, or we may talk to sort of, you know, similar bodies to the UK and other parts of the world. But it's all about, you know, trying to sort of do things that sort of take us towards that goal of ensuring that, you know, tax policy and tax rules, you know, provide the best opportunity possible for the sector to thrive. And obviously, you know, um, with a view to, you know, governments benefiting from that, because I don't think anybody in the financial services sector doesn't expect to pay tax. Um, but there are certain key things that the tax group like to focus on. We like there to be sort of consistent and certain policies that people can predict around. So, you know, something that's very important, I think, for uh, financial businesses is forecasting. Uh, and if tax rules are constantly changing, you can't forecast, you know, what your expenses will be because, you know, there's always that sort of uncertainty about, well, you know, you know, how much are we going to have to pay going forward if we make X amount of profit? Are the tax rates going to move? You know, what are our deferred tax assets worth, etc. So, you know, we, we look for things that sort of help, you know, sustain the UK's financial services sector in the long term from a tax perspective. Um, and we try and encourage, you know, government as much as possible to, you know, be transparent with the industry and, and, and you know, encourage members of City UK to reciprocate so that it's a, it's a, it's a grown up relationship that can benefit everyone. Absolutely. Um, maybe I can ask a slightly cheeky question. Forgive me for not giving you a uh, full sight of this, but I wanted to ask both of you, if you were made Chancellor for the day on the 27th of October, which is obviously a key day uh, for uh, British politics and indeed tax policy being the date of the next spending review and budget, what, what kind of things would you put in that budget if you were, if you were in charge of that? Janet, maybe I could come to you. It would be interesting to have your views. But before I do that, if I can encourage our audience also uh, to put some questions in, in the Q&A box, I, I will put those to our panel. Janet, over to you. Chancellor, Chancellor Kerr, over to you. So, am I, so I was, my response to that really <clears throat> is um, in, in setting tax policy, it, it's, it, it's really useful to have the data to inform that policy. So, you know, whatever, there's a, a range of, um, of taxes. And so I, I think my, my answer to that uh, would be, if I was chancellor, I would, the thing that I would request, the thing that I would ask for is, um, is just really comprehensive data to inform my decisions on the taxes. So, so in the same way that we've got the total tax contribution for the legal and accounting sector, actually to have that, that full picture for, for other sectors to understand that data in this data-driven age, to understand that, that data um, uh, in, in kind of the broader context, um, that I think would be would be my ask as Chancellor. Wonderful. Uh, and you, Sandy, as, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, what would you do? Okay, well, I'm going to be slightly cheeky and I'm going to avoid talking about specific changes because um, I, there's actually a couple of Gibson Dunn clients who have joined this call and I don't want to say anything that might offend anybody. But I think that I agree with what Janet said, which is that I think sometimes um, senior politicians do make decisions without all of the facts. Uh, and that is a dangerous thing to do. I also think that the nature of democracy, and you know, I'm not saying this is a good thing or a bad thing, um, but the nature of democracy in our country means that you know chancellors are encouraged 
to make changes that can sometimes be either populist or they only have a short term impact in mind. So if I was chancellor for the day, I would take the view that it's time for us to actually look at what is best for the country long term. I would probably ask my advisors to help me put together a tax roadmap for the country. Um, and that would be something that would be sort of carefully considered and costed. And then that would be put to the country and it'd be given as a commitment to what tax policy will in the UK be. And it will only deviate in you know, the most extreme of economic circumstances. Because I think that, that it's that tax will always be complex. You know, the nature of business in the world today, it's always going to be complex, but you can take steps to make it more certain. And if you do that, that would encourage activity in the UK, investment into the UK, because you can effectively know what the rules will be and what the parameters will be when you do things. Um, I think as much as possible, you need to make tax a consequence of doing business. But where possible, you need to take tax out of the equation as to why you do business in a particular way and encourage people more and more to just look at commercial drivers for what you're doing, transactions in the way that you're doing them or activities in the way you're doing them, you know, with an element of certainty and hopefully consistency, you know, you can sort of eliminate the need for tax to always be so kind of complicated, complicated and intrinsic to what's going on that you know, sometimes you end up in a situation where people just can't properly predict and plan for the future. Thanks. Uh, maybe I could dig into that a, a little bit more, Sandy. So we're at the CCUK looking at the long-term competitiveness of the industry. Do you think tax competitiveness is central to that? And when we talk about tax competitiveness, what, what do we really mean? What, what makes up that competitiveness? Um, I think it is central to that. And, it, and it's probably what I've just said. You know, competitiveness, you know, in, in simple terms, just means that people look at the UK and you can sort of look around the rest of the world and think, yeah, you know, the, the UK has got a sensible regime. You kind of know where you stand. Um, you're not going to be hit by too many surprises and you can trust in the tax authorities to behave sensibly, be transparent if you're transparent with them. You know, yes, on the occasions that you have bad actors, they sort of need to be sort of, you know, taken to task by the tax authorities, but certainly the vast majority businesses I deal with, they're good corporate citizens and they just want to make sure that they're paying the right amount of tax. Um, you know, the, the UK has a reputation as being the sort of cradle of the rule of law, but increasingly over the years, you know, the behaviour of, uh, of, of HMRC has meant that, you know, that kind of erosion of the way that we sort of legislate clearly for tax and it's become more about sort of smell tests and, you know, what does the guidance say rather than what does the law say and what do we think revenue's attitude is to, you know, particular aspects of applying. Uh, sorry, of the law applying. I mean, you look around a lot of what happens today, just in the media, for example, a lot of the debate about tax is misinformed. And therefore, I think that has a knock on impact in the, you know, the way that taxpayers are dealt with by tax authorities can sometimes be misinformed. So all of that, plus many other things sort of fit into the matrix of tax competitiveness, which is absolutely crucial to the UK's success going forward. And more specifically, um, the Chancellor gave um, the, the country some advance notice of the increase in corporation tax, which is due to come in in 2023. Sandy, what, what would, given that that's happening, what would you like to see happen to the, to the banking surcharge and indeed the levy uh, alongside that increase? Um, I mean, I don't have any personal preferences not being from a bank, but I mean, I, I, I can see the logic of reducing or eliminating the surcharge. But frankly, I could see the logic of that regardless of a tax increase in the main rate of corporation tax, because you, know, you can argue that at one point it was appropriate for banks to pay more tax than other financial services businesses because there was a sort of a punitive element. Uh, I mean, I'm not necessarily sure that I think that's the right way to go about it, but if that's what it was targeted at, then fine. Does that need still exist? I'm not sure it does. But in any case, I think it's probably time uh, or beyond time for you know, financial services businesses to be taxed consistently. And the surcharge is just you know, another sort of incremental way to sort of take more tax out of a particular subsector of financial services. And I just don't think it's appropriate. You know, likewise with the banking levy, I mean, again, it was sort of used initially as a sort of revenue raiser for um, the, the treasury and it was sort of targeting a particular sector. It's gone through a fairly radical overhaul because obviously, its original design sort of meant that, you know, UK headquartered banks could face quite a high bill relative to say, you know, offshore 
um, banks that had you know UK branches, for example. And um, but even that redesign, I think, does miss the kind of broader point, which is what is the purpose fulfilled by taxes? You know, th you know, th there's always a sort of an element of you know tax and politics being you know intertwined. But I I, I still think that you know things like the surcharge hint at piecemeal tax policy. They don't really they don't really sort of they don't sort of you know give off um, the impression of a, of a jurisdiction that have thought long term about what's best for the industry and what's the best way for that industry to start to thrive. And it also ignores that you know tax is collected at different points in the chain, which I think is another thing that the PwC reports report highlights really well. Because just because you don't pay taxes at a corporate level doesn't mean you don't necessarily pick up those taxes you know in other parts, whether it's at the employee or the stakeholder level or whether it's at the service level. You you have to look at sort of you know tax in the overall round when you look at its contribution corporation tax itself contributes relatively little to the uk coffers compared to other taxes um and yet we spend a disproportionate amount of time and money collecting it. and it's all this sorts of stuff that just gets missed when you're doing things like you know introducing short-term short-sighted tax changes that are just designed to appease you know a particular sort of feeling amongst the populace and you know appearing to look like they're tough on a particular industry but are not necessarily for the greater good. Probably Thanks, more than I intended yeah. to though. Uh, um, Janet, back over to you, interested in your I've got an even punchier question for you that's just come from our audience in a minute, Sandy. So um get ready for that one while I get I turn to uh Janet. Uh, it was about it's about windfall taxes. Um Janet, over to you. I'd be interested in your thoughts on what Sandy's just been talking about, um, the surcharge, the levy. These seem to be taxes obviously that are aimed at a specific sector, not all sectors are being treated equitably and, and obviously the interaction of that with the proposed rise in corporation tax. Interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, and, and Emma, I kind of, I, I go back to my data point again as well. You know, how, what does this look like? Um, what what data can you get? And, and kind of tying that to the competitiveness point as well. You know, if you look at the levy and the surcharge in the UK and compare that with what does the picture look like in other um, banking sectors, the UK has got, you know, leading uh, financial services sector. So, and, you know, a, an investment bank is a, is a mobile uh, business. So to what extent does, does that tax burden in the UK compare with other international cent centers? And I do think kind of understanding those numbers, understanding that comparison, is really important in in developing uh, policy around that, um, and uh, yeah, no, uh, kind of agree with uh, with Sandy in in terms of um, you know where where that that might go. Thank you. That's really clear. So, so Sandy, here's another one for for you from our audience. Um, we've seen talk recently of the potential for windfall taxes to be imposed by government on sectors that have performed well during the pandemic. I mean, some say when we say we pay a lot in tax, they say, well, we'll tax you more. That's one way of looking at it. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be uh, advocating that, by the way, but that may be one argument that you hear from um, some parts of the political system. Um, clearly, the legal and accountancy sectors could be in the firing line if such uh, windfall taxes uh, came to pass. So, uh, interested in both Sandy and Janet's view on the risks of such windfall taxes being imposed. It relates to what you just said, actually, Janet, and what the merits or other ways are of windfall taxes. Firstly, to you, uh, Sandy, then I'll come to you, Janet. Um, I'd be surprised if there was a sort of separate kind of one-off windfall tax imposed on, you know, legal and accounting firms. Um, a lot of those businesses are established as partnerships or, or LLPs. And so if they were going to go after that part of the industry for more tax. My suspicion is, is that it would be a change in the national insurance rules or something about, you know, when you're on the, uh, you know, the employer self-employed boundary, because, you know, there are things that the UK government have been doing over the years to sort of, you know, go after taxpayers, you know, um, in that sort of, in that area. And they could probably do more if they really wanted to collect more tax from, 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 from people in those businesses. But I would be surprised if they wanted to, Sort of do something that would fulfil the kind of dictionary definition of a windfall tax, which is sort of a one-off raid on the coffers. Got you, Janet. Uh, and um, I mean, the purpose of the work we've done of, of the survey wasn't to kind of look at um, things like windfall taxes, but if I just 
kind of pull out a couple of the points, um, and Angelica referred to this in her presentation. Um, you know, if you look at the, if you look at what legal accounting firms distribute in terms of taxes, in terms of wages, in terms of you know profits uh, for the partners, forty-seven percent of that total uh, is paid in taxes. Thirty-three percent is paid to employees. So I do think it's important to, to look at the taxes in context. If you compare the taxes borne, so these are taxes that are a cost to firms. Um, if you compare those taxes borne to profits, uh, that, that, that figure is 54%. So uh, when you're talking about you know, paying a lot of tax, I do think it's helpful as well uh, to put those, those payments um, in context. Yeah, that's in incredibly helpful. Thank you, Janet. And Co it goes back to your point about evidence-based um, policy making. Um, I I'd like to just broaden this out to, um, for a minute, just reflect on what's been going on internationally. It, you know, it's been very interesting in recent months, uh, not least at the G7, um, to, to look at what the debate uh, amongst world leaders on, on tax, which is sort of seems to me to have risen up the agenda in a way that taxation policy that is amongst global leaders than, than it has for, for quite some time. I wonder, uh, Sandy, if you could talk us through, um, you know, the OCD framework, what are the main proposals and why it's been important that the UK government, and they have been supportive of this, um, has been defending the exclusion of financial services from, from part of that framework, from one of those pillars. Um, maybe you could talk us through the, re the reasoning next explanation of that that would be really helpful sorry that's um, to you Sandy <laughs> yeah sure um I guess I'll, I'll just sort of take a couple of steps back I'm I'm sure everyone on the on the on the on the call is familiar with this but just in case you're not so you know the OECD have had a number of initiatives going um in in recent years and most of them stem from the sort of original BEPS initiative you know base erosion and profit shifting and there were a number of um action items that you know came out of that um and they have you know, to, to differing degrees progress to either, you know, existing legislation or legislation that will be implemented shortly. Uh, and that's been a kind of, you know, worldwide effort because it's, it's got, in, you know, a lot of support across a number of OECD members and, uh, you know, a number of these uh, action points have been ratified at either the, the G7 or the G20 level. The one that's got the most press attention recently is the initiatives uh, in relation to digital economy digital businesses. Um, uh, there's a lot of detail to this, so I, I, I won't go into it too much given that we've only got 11 minutes left. But, you know, in broad terms, what we're talking about is, you know, certain categories of business that fall within the definition of, 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 of the digital economy that the OECD are using. Um, and after a lot of kind of toing and froing uh, and debate amongst the inclusive framework, We've now reached agreement. Um, I think it's I think it's now 137 countries. I sometimes lose track of who's not in and who's now back in. Um, it's a, it's a sort of a daily thing, but it's um, the, the inclusive framework has sort of put together sort of two pillars, if you like, um, and they are basically agreeing how these sorts of businesses will be taxed in the future. And the idea is is that it's an agreement such that countries will implement rules that enable consistent taxation of those sorts of businesses in all of the, the relevant countries. And so, um, there, as I said, there's been a lot of kind of detail um, that has gone into that process, but essentially you've got what's called pillar one, and that's effectively trying to create a sort of a new way of, or, or an adjusted way rather, of taxing businesses that fall into you know, this, this digital economy basket. Um, uh, and the idea is, is that it's now been sort of reduced to target a, a small number of global corporate groups um, and they will pay tax at what's called sort of above normal profit. Um, and it, you're allocating more tax to what is called, you know, market jurisdictions. And so more of the profit of those global businesses is allocated to the market jurisdictions, i.e., you know, from, for want of a better way of defining it, just where their customers are. Um, and it's being done on a formulary basis. Um, and this is obviously, you know, a change in approach for both taxpayers and tax authorities. So there's a whole load of stuff that kind of goes with it in relation to audit and approach, etc. And then there's pillar two, um, which effectively was to start with the sort of the anti-avoidance aspect of 
of pillar one. Um, and that's gone through various derivations. And we've now got to a situation where what we're going to have is a sort of a jurisdictional level minimum tax system. And so you'll have a minimum effective rate of 15%. Um, and, you know, you have to do a number of things where you'll have to use you know, a mixture of accounting and tax rules, calculate the effective tax rate. Um, and then there'll be, you know, a number of sort of ways of working out whether or not appropriate amounts are sort of being taken in the sort of tax chain. Um, and there's a sort of number of different sort of provisions within that uh, pillar two construct that sort of, you know, help taxpayers work out, you know, what they are and are not paying in particular jurisdictions. And so, you know, that's, you know, um, it's gone through the sort of tail end of its political process, um, you know, in, in recent months. And we're now in a situation where we've got a provisionally agreed implementation timetable. I say provisionally because I personally don't believe it can possibly be implemented in the timetable that's con uh, contemplated because there's just so much to do and there's so much detail to work through. Um, one of the reasons why um, financial services got so much kind of press attention through that process and it was used as a bit of a political football is that obviously financial services is hugely important for the UK, possibly not so important for some of the other countries who wanted different things to go into the proposal. And so, you know, being able to sort of leverage the UK and say, well, OK, if you want this, then you can't have this and using the financial services sector in the UK as a sort of bargaining chip, you know, it, it was perhaps inevitable that that would happen. But a lot of these businesses that fall within scope, the reason why people feel or some people feel that they don't pay the appropriate amount of tax already in market jurisdictions is because they lack any kind of sort of tangible or, or taxable presence in those jurisdictions. Regulated financial businesses have to have, you know, for you know, corporate and commercial and regulatory purposes, you know, big establishments in the jurisdictions where they operate. They have to have capital, they have to have um, people who are skilled in order to do the jobs that they're doing in those jurisdictions. And so it isn't really the case that these proposals were even targeted at that type of business and therefore would even be appropriate. And the overwhelming likelihood is, is that there'd be virtually no extra tax collected by you know, applying these rules to you know, multinational financial services businesses. There's a bit of an open question at the moment as to what is regulated financial services for the purposes of the definition in the in the proposal, but you know, we won't get into that now. But given that it was going to apply, well, given, sorry, given that if it did apply, you wouldn't be collecting any more tax. All you're really talking about here is applying something to financial services businesses that just cost them a lot of money in compliance terms. Um, and in effect, what you're doing is just saying, right, spend more money on something that isn't gonna get anyone anywhere. Um, if nothing else, it will just reduce the profitability of those businesses. And lo and behold, you reduce a business's profitability and all of a sudden it pays less tax. So there was just no logical reason for applying these proposals to the kinds of financial services businesses that, um, uh, well, certainly that um, are part of this UK um, and, 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 and perhaps beyond. And so I think that was one of the things that the government and the industry were very aligned on from the word go. Um, and I believe that, you know, there were a number of people within the inclusive framework and within the G7 who, who understood that and accepted that for the greater good of the global financial services industry, you know, it shouldn't be applied. Um, not everyone necessarily agreed with that, though. So it did become a bit of a heated debate. But I believe we are hopefully going to get to a reasonable position, which is good for the industry. Thanks, that's a really good overview. Janet, I'd be just interested in your views on this too. And, and you know, there are other industries where it's not as simple uh, to tax it. I'm thinking shipping uh, is one that springs to mind or, or, or you know, that, that those digital uh, new tech businesses too. I'd just be interested in your thoughts of the, of the way in which different industries and sectors are, are taxed and how different that is. Yeah, and and when you when you pull that this total tax contribution data together, it does become evident about you know the different ways that businesses are taxed. But Emma, just to kind of take it up, um, kind of stand back for a moment um, to look at. Obviously, uh, businesses are becoming digital, and so we need you know the, the focus on it from a policy perspective. But I think there's something else there too, which is Kind of trust in business. So um, looking at how much tax companies pay, uh, there can be, you know, um, challenge on, on uh, the amount of tax that companies pay and actually trust in business. And I think that the whole um, 
the total tax contribution, the broad range of taxes, actually making that uh, message uh, public or, or focusing, focusing on the, the broader contribution that a company makes can help with that, that broader um, trust in business. And you know, how, however your business is taxed, understanding the business model and how the taxes arise through that business model can be a really powerful way in um, communicating for the financial services sector and, and other sectors as well, um, you know, how tax works and that broader contribution in, in taxes. Couldn't agree more. And at the CTUK, we're very um, painfully aware of that because I, one of the uh, work streams that we are very focused on is trust and reputation and the reputation of, of our industry with um, ministers, parliamentarians, civil servants, uh, and other uh, policymakers and opinion formers, and ensuring, as you said before, Janet, that there is that understanding. And I think this report really contributes to the understanding of those policymakers, hopefully, uh, in, in the contribution of our industry, but also how, uh, as you've set out, how these different taxes are uh, levied and, uh, and to what, um, but also the wider contribution, as you said, in terms of employment, and the, the outlook remaining actually really positive, even, even despite the pandemic, the, the level of uh, graduates, the number of, uh, of people working in the industry who are uh, highly skilled and highly productive. Um, so a huge thank you to PwC and to you personally, Janet, for the research and the work that you've put into this uh, report. We look forward to uh, seeing the next edition of this report and that for your predictions to be to come true that you that you talked about earlier and sandy a huge thank you to you for the work that you do in chairing our tax committee and for your contribution to uh, our panel this afternoon so without further ado i'd like to say thank you to our audience and encourage everybody to read the total tax contribution report that we launched today uh, and thanks again to our panelists thanks to ian little granger and to our chief economist Angelica Bardolai. And thank you to you, the audience, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much.